Okay, so our first speaker is Sora Chang, so from Coventry University in UK. So he will be talking about approaches to achieving night zero emission for long haul highway good vehicles by 2015. 2050, sorry. A review of a proposed pathway. Saurabh is pursuing his PhD degree at Coventry University. So he is also a regional head of KPIT Technology LTD. So today he will focus on introducing current approaches for decarbonizing highway good vehicles, always say HGVs, and talking about potential research gaps and open challenges. So welcome you. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the introduction. Let me uh, quickly share my screen so that I can begin with the presentation. Uh, Hong, can please confirm if, if my audio is all right and, and if you are able to see my screen? Yeah, I can. Yeah, thank you. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks a lot. So it's my pleasure to uh, present to the audience here. And uh, as, as Hong mentioned, uh, my name is Saurabh Jha and uh, I'm pursuing my PhD at Coventry University, uh, focusing on road freight decarbonization as uh, in the area of my research and uh, you know, exploring ways in which uh, the pathway to 2050 net zero uh, can be expedited. So in today's presentation, I'll be focusing on um, uh, a review of what are the existing pathways and, and are there any gaps and what can be done uh, to build, uh, what kind of model can be used to build a, a pathway to net zero by 2050, especially for the long haul uh, heavy goods vehicles. So uh, moving on, as you can see here, uh, a bit complex slide, but uh, this is a very recent, uh, uh, this is the working group report from IPCC's uh, uh, sixth assessment, which came out uh, in August this year, just a month ago. And it clearly highlighted the challenges the, the world is facing uh, on the, uh, regarding the climate change. And one of the things the report had focused on that, uh, what are various scenarios as we are heading to 2050 what are the various scenarios uh, when it comes to the temperature, uh, the global temperature rise to, uh, or the limiting the global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees centigrade. So in this report, um, they, they built multiple scenarios. If you can follow my mouse, you can see here, these are the various scenarios which were focused on. And the best case scenario, even if in, in the best case scenario, they said that we are probably likely to limit the temperature rise to 1.5 degrees centigrade by end of the century. So it only highlights the challenge because even if you look at the best case scenario, which which means we, we need to have 27 gigaton of annual emission till 2030. And just to give you a perspective, the global emissions are in the range of 40 gigaton, uh, more or less. So uh, to achieve the best case scenario, uh, so as we can limit the temperature rise to 1.5 degrees centigrade, we really have a you know, very tough challenge uh, uh, in front of us. So uh, while this slide highlights the, the challenge we are facing, uh, the, the, the point is that all the sectors within the industry will have to contribute to it. And transport in contributes to about uh, a quarter of global uh, 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 CO2 emissions. And unlike other sectors, which is power, industrial, agriculture, transport is one sector where the emissions are continuously growing. So that makes it more challenging and more imminent to address. Now within the transport sector, if you look at it, the, the road, uh, uh, I mean, these are the contributing sectors. This is the you know, data from the IEA. And as you can see, while passenger uh, vehicles are the topmost contributor, but the projections, and this this is not just IEA data, but if you, you can see projection across various reports and research articles, you would clearly see that there is a, a steep uh, fall projected in the emissions for the passenger vehicles. But, but the same steepness is not noticed for the road freight vehicles. So that obviously brings more focus on the road freight vehicles. Uh, and even within road freight vehicles, there are two types of uh, uh, vehicles which are you know, uh, contributing. Uh, one are more light commercial vehicles, which are less than 3.5 tons of gross weight. And these are the vehicles which are used for more 
लास्ट माइल डिलीवरी और आई वुड से इंट्रा सिटी और नॉट शॉर्ट हॉल मोमेंट्स बट the heavy goods vehicles which is more than 3.5 tons of gross vehicle weight they are the ones which are used mostly for long haul transportation long haul freight transportation and you can very well see the dispro- disproportionate share of emissions which the heavy goods vehicles contribute to despite having a 30% vehicle share they contribute to about 75% of the co2 emissions so uh, with that perspective uh, one thing which we found out and if you look at the uh, and, and again from here from this slide onwards the focus will be more on the heavy goods vehicles uh, at, at gvs the heavy goods vehicles now there are various things which are been proposed because if we have to achieve net zero then every sector and every segment has to contribute so there has to be a road map which needs to be built for heavy goods vehicles as well as to how do we achieve net zero by 2050 uh, the existing uh, Uh, options on the table or existing approaches on the table are mostly based on improving or making uh, 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 the current system or current uh, uh, the incumbent more eff- efficient which is the uh, the diesel engines so there have been lots of uh, and, and there is a pathway where you can actually achieve up to 20 25% uh, uh, further reduction in the emissions on the existing vehicles by by use of various technologies and uh, various optimizations which you can do but obviously that will not take us to net zero and if you look at what would take us to net zero then there is a kind of wider agreement within the literature as well and and in the industry as well that we will need full electrification which means we would need uh, you know the uh, 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 battery electric i mean lithium ion based battery electric or the other options of fuel cell electric or uh, uh, catenary electric or, or 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 anything which will give us not only the zero tailgate emissions which we can also which can also give us uh, Uh, much less emissions uh, i would say you know the the well to tank emission which is the emission which is involved in getting the fuel to the vehicle so uh, while we have to achieve go from here to here these are the two key imperatives we have to keep in mind one is that while we have to achieve net zero emissions by 2050 the other important thing to keep in mind and i think this is something which not many people take take into account when they build the pathway is that you might achieve net zero by 2050 but you might on the way emit so much carbon that you will exceed your carbon budget uh, which is uh, there in place to help us restrict the temperature rise to uh, less than 1.5 degrees so we have to keep these two imperatives in mind when we are building any uh, pathway to net zero emission on that uh, further on uh, i did some comparison of existing electrification options and prominently two of them which are most more, more uh, prominent are battery electric and fuel cell electric and on comparing them with a uh, uh, internal combustion engine which is the current uh, existing option on the road i compared them on various cost and operational suitability uh, parameters so a higher score means less suitability or more costly a lower score means a better suitability or a better uh, you know, cost feasibility and if you look at these all parameters there are there are there are challenges in market readiness as we can see for the existing uh, electrification options for example either the acquisition cost is very high or the investment which is needed in the infrastructure for recharging uh, for the uh, ch- charging the vehicles is very high uh, even the there are from operation suitability there are weight constraints for example the amount of weight which gets added for every kilowatt hour of energy is much higher for uh, these two then the existing diesel option for example you know the battery adds to the weight even the hydrogen while hydrogen itself doesn't add to the weight but the tankers add to the weight so uh, and obviously the total cost of ownership so uh, again this is a data based on the current uh, i mean uh, this is this is current scenario obviously things can change as the technology improves and and electrification can be adopted and can become more you know in uh, uh, operationally more suitable but this is how it stands right now uh a bit uh, uh clutter so not clutter i'll say busy slide but i will focus more on the context here the given uh, uh, uh the challenges around electrification as i showed in the previous slide uh, there was an analysis of all the i would say the reports in the past 3 years and we focused on eu and uk as a region Uh, to understand that what are what is what is the research saying and what are the reports saying what is how do we what is the net zero uh, scenario in 2050 and and what i noticed that the the net zero mix in 
has lots of variations when it comes to what everyone is recommending. So there are multiple options while there are electrification, which everyone is proposing, but there are other options as well. For example, people are also putting, uh, proposing synthetic hydrocarbon. People are also proposing catenary electric or, or pantograph based, uh, uh, the electric road system as well. Um, so there are multiple options and there are also multiple transition pathways as well, because you, you do need a transition pathway from moving to full electrification or, or, or even some, some are saying that no, there is no transition pathway needed. But having said that, the, the main point here is that everyone has, there's a lot of variation, there is no consensus. And the reason for that is what factors they are considering for adoption of technology. And that becomes very important because the, while some are focusing more on policy, some are focusing more on investment. Uh, so a further uh, categorization of the factors was done uh, to see uh, what is coming out in terms of uh, heavy goods vehicles, road freight vehicles. Uh, it was found that uh, the categories are mostly around cost. When I say cost, I mean anything, either it's the cost of uh, total cost of ownership for vehicle or it, it, it's the investment which is required to make the vehicle fit in the system of the charging infrastructure and, and all, or it's the technology or the policy support, for example, what regulations we are keeping in place or uh, what incentives um, the governments are creating for, for all uh, uh, new technologies and the operational suitability. And obviously, as you can see here, the operational suitability was not covered uh, as comprehensively as probably it should have been, but however, the policy was quite well covered across reports. Uh, that led to the next question, that okay if that's the case then can we understand how these uh, models are built or how do you actually go about building a decarbonization pathway and projecting the emissions for any particular vehicle segment uh, when that was done lots of transport models were studied a literature review was carried out and what was noted that essentially there are three basic steps everyone i mean it were common across most of the studies first of all you try to project what will be the vehicle stock in future. For example, you're trying to project uh, emissions for 2050. Then you first figure out what are the, um, what is the vehicle's uh, stock size we are looking at 2050. So the, so there's a projection you do based on various factors, whether you know some people link it to GDP, some people link to you know, various other economic parameters, but, but they come out at what is the vehicle stock. Then that stock is uh, allocated across various technologies. For example, you know, if I have say 100 vehicles, then I allocate 20% to fuel, uh, battery electric, say 30% to fuel cell electric, or maybe 20% to uh, catenary electric, or I say 20% can still be diesel or biofuel. So based on uh, consumer preference attributes, which, be, which means by building a utility model where based on what utility, what technology is giving, the share of the technology is calculated. And once that is there, then the calculating the emissions becomes straightforward because for each technology you have standards defined. There are standard emission factors which which are available, which have been you know researched and and, and further being researched as well. And then you come out at the emissions. So these are three basic steps which have been used across models. However, uh, what was noticed is that while the basic steps are there, but then the models are still very uh, varied in scope. While all of them are trying to find emissions or project emissions. But their scopes are quite different. For example, some vehicle level models are focused more on uh, 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 from a, you know, the performance and emissions around vehicle. Uh, and, and sometimes they do aggregate, sometimes they don't aggregate. The other systems, other models which focus more on energy system, which means the total energy required for the transportation and the total energy produced and total energy consumed. And that is another way where lots of models are in place. But the best ones which were found were system level models because they were more comprehensive in scope and they had covered you know, both the, ener the energy systems, the vehicle system, the, the, trans the freight system, the transport system as well. So they were found very comprehensive. But one thing which was common to all of them was this part, at least to two of them, I would say not to vehicle level, but energy and system level model was again using that as consumer preference attribute. So while you can, uh, as I had mentioned in the previous slide also, if you, if you remember, this part, second part is actually the most important part because this is what helps you decide which technology will a consumer choose. And, and that is what uh, uh, was uh, further uh, un, uh, you know, uh, uh, tr uh, no, explored. And what was figured out is that any consumer choice model basically works on works like this. You, you, you first, you find out what are the factors uh, what are the attributes 
which actually should be considered while adopting a new technology. So for example, it could be the purchase price, the fuel cost or the how the availability of fuel because that will depend on how the infrastructure growth is happening when it comes to the charging availability or what no and the range the emission. So once you define the attributes, then you define build a model. And again, there are ways in which these models are built. But ultimately, if you can see here, this is the utility. So basically, you find out what utility ultimately is derived from these uh, uh, choice parameters. And based on the utility, you ultimately arrive at a market share, which means a choice probability. So using you, you can find out what for each technology, what is the market share. So I won't deep dive into the details here, but, but the, what was noted that when it comes to deciding or choosing the preference attributes, there was a lot of variation across uh, research and, and probably there is a lack of a comprehensive set of preference attributes because, you know, uh, uh, and, and there are some of them which I put. And also in this, I will share with you a link of a survey and I will really be, you know, uh, uh, very grateful if you can actually respond to that survey. It's a simple three-page survey and I will ping the link in the, in the chat window here uh, towards the end of my session. And that link, uh, what I would request you to do is to share your thoughts on what are, what do you think uh, for the road freight segment or the, especially for the heavy goods segment, what should be the, the, the choice parameters and what should be the kind of the weightage you assign to or the priority you assign to them. So for example, do you think cost is the most important criteria or you think the, the emissions is the most important criteria or the, uh, you know, payload capacity. So, I will, uh, in, in the link, you will be seeing uh, those details and, and, and um, uh, it will be very helpful if you can fill that survey. So just to summarize, uh, what have we seen so far? And that will lead me to the conclusion slide which follows. So we saw the imperatives. We found, we saw that there were you no know, main imperatives around uh, achieving the emission and making sure that the emission is achieved within the limit. The cumulative emissions don't exceed the budget which we have kept for ourselves. And then we noticed the gaps. We found out that the operational suitability, for example, was ignored. We also found out that the choice parameters were not very comprehensive, especially, and again, I'm talking all of this with respect to heavy goods vehicles, because please uh, note that when it comes to passenger cars, a lot more research has been done and a lot more clarity probably is there when it comes to the decarbonation pathway, but, but that's not the case at all with the heavy goods vehicles. So we noticed that there were choice parameters were not comprehensive, uh, which brings, uh, which uh, kind of creates a need for a holistic model which can cover the gaps and which can cater to the imperatives. So that means what and, and what could be benefit of such a model. So uh, this such a model can, number one, it can cater to, cater to broader stakeholders because if you remember I had talked about system level models. Using the system level models, you can actually cover wider stakeholders and we can cover wider regimes. You can um, do a more socio-technical approach to building a technology adoption. And even these models can not only project the emissions, but you can actually use them to also uh, analyze impact on the road freight system. Apologies for the typo here. It's a road freight system efficiency. And then lastly, you can use these models to also create solution blocks, which can help you expedite the emission reduction. Which means, for example, if you are uh, doing adopting a data-driven solution, then without changing the technology, you can actually uh, expedite the emission reduction. Uh, to give an example, for you know, for example, even if it's a battery technology you're trying to adopt or a fuel set technology you're trying to adopt, um, the way uh, uh, for ex uh, the way the the power uh, the allocation of uh, uh, the control systems work in these things, they can be optimized using data using uh, uh, data driven solutions approaches, and which can make the existing technology more uh, efficient in terms of emissions. So the model should be able to cater to uh, all of this and give us these benefits. So uh, there is a reference model using the same uh, approach which I mentioned in the previous slide has been built. Again, this is only a reference, which means it is uh, only the key elements are defined. The model has not been built uh, as in you know, to, to be running actually, but only the elements have been defined. And as you can see here, the, the while it gives you the aggregate emissions as an output on the right hand side here, it also gives you the impact on the road freight efficiency because you might achieve net zero, but if at, if that comes at a cost of 
uh, uh, compromise on the road freight efficiency itself, then probably you know people will have to think whether is is that the right pathway to adopt. So that also an output which you can get from the model, and 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 most importantly, you can also inject data driven blocks solutions here, so as you can actually expedite your uh, emission reduction in the transition pathway or on the on the road to 2050.